All right, let me just say this real quick as just a housekeeping thing. You can take your seat. It's all right. Um, sorry, I didn't make you freeze. Uh, as soon as we're done, I think it'll be after the invitation song. Jesse Cargill is going to run up here. He's going to go over the um, uh, involvement for forms. I'm looking for Jesse. I don't know where he went to. There you are. Uh, you don't have the clicker, do you, Jesse? Because I don't have the clicker, so this is going to be fun. Um, so just keep your seats. After we're done, we'll, um, we'll let Jesse take the floor. He's going to walk you through that so you can have a better understanding of that. All right, it, it is a good uh, Sunday morning. We're thankful that you're here with, uh, with us at North Heights for this beautiful worship that we've had and for this great Father's Day that we're currently having. Happy Father's Day to all of you who are fathers. We, I, I do not have a Father's Day or Father-themed, pardon me, uh, sermon for you as I go down the stage to talk to Alex. Thank you. Um, I, I know it's usually a thing that we do. We'll try to make the holidays a thing. We'll have a holiday-themed sermon. It just kind of slipped through the cracks. It's, I guess it's my fault because this is my week, and I just didn't think of it, but there is a little point that I will make that is father-esque. Uh, I'll just make it as an aside, and I may build a whole sermon around it for some, some sermon on Father's Day in the future, but if you came here expecting a Father's Day sermon, I'm sorry to leave you disappointed. What we are going to do, which hopefully you'll, you'll uh, appreciate and, and get something from, is continue our series that we've been kind of peppering throughout the year uh, as it relates to the Apostles, the series entitled Get to Know Your Apostles. We've basically taken the 12, and we're not taking them one at a time. There's a few that we're grouping together. But we're basically just introducing or perhaps reintroducing you to these men whom Jesus has chosen to be his ambassadors, to walk in his steps after he ascends into heaven, to guide the early church and to lead over them and to help them and shape them into the image of the kind of kingdom on earth that he wants. But who are these people? What characteristics do they exhibit that we can learn from as we ourselves are being called and chosen? chosen by Jesus to follow after him and to be his disciples as these 12 originally were as well. So we've already considered, in other words, midway through the year, we've considered about half of the apostles uh, in the series. And we've already considered all of the ones, except for Judas and Paul, who will come at the end, we've considered all the ones that we know a lot about. We've gotten Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Those are the four who were basically always with the Lord. The others were kind of around, but you always read about those four, at least Peter, James, and John, and often Andrew too, with him. But also next came Philip and Thomas too, which I just, Alex preached on Thomas last time, but I just always love the idea of we have the song that says Thomas too, because as you know, Thomas is Didymus, Didymus means twin, so he was Thomas the twin. So there was another brother, a brother to Thomas, a twin brother. And in my mind, in my head canon, Thomas came out second. Thomas was the second born of the two. And so they have the first son. Let's call him Fred. Here's Fred. They give Fred to the mother. And oh, Thomas too. And from then on, Thomas was always Thomas too. You get ice cream, you'll get ice cream too. Thomas too. Or you'll get a spanking and Thomas too will get a spanking for what you did. It's always Thomas too. Thomas too. And I can, in my mind... He just grew up loathing that phrase, and now we have immortalized it in the song. Whenever we think of him, he's always, and Thomas too. And then now we have Matthew and Bartholomew. So let's talk about Matthew. I know, he's handsome, isn't he? That's just, I, got it, I got it from an old Latin history book of the apostles, and I just copied it exactly as it was, glasses and all. Handsome fellow, that apostle Matthew. So let's talk about Matthew. What are some things that we know about Matthew? Well, as I say, we've already covered the ones about whom we know the most, the two that we're going to look at this morning, Matthew and Bartholomew, we have a great account of their being called by Jesus and then nothing else. The next set of apostles are James, the one they call the less, Simon, also Thaddeus, and I just gave you everything the Bible says about them. So I'm looking forward to preaching that sermon in a little while. But about Matthew and Bartholomew, we have at least an account of their being called. But still, we know some things. We can learn some things about them. Matthew, his name in the Greek, Matthias, means, are you ready for this? Gift of God. And doesn't it, doesn't it ever? I didn't even need to look that one up. I just knew that implicitly. Gift of God. But that's just the Greek form of his name. There is other, another Bible account in Luke's account that calls him by his Hebrew name, which is Levi. Levi doesn't mean gift of God. Levi, the Hebrew word, has an entirely different meaning. Levi, of course, as you know, the Levites were the Hebrew tribe, the Israelite tribe, who facilitated the priesthood and the worship services and the worship activities and things, the spiritual activities, the heart of the, the nation, were conducted through the Levite tribe. So you would naturally think Levi, that root word, would relate. And in the Hebrew word, it kind of sort of does but I don't think the Hebrews invented the word Levi, and I'll tell you that in a second. But the Hebrew word Levi means to attach, to attach yourself. 
And not in the sense of like a, a physical, you know, like a hug or an animal that latches onto you, but more in the sense of this is a thing that I want to participate in. I will attach myself to it. I will connect myself, be associated with. That kind of attachment is at the heart of Levi. So you can think, you can kind of make a connection between that idea and those who attach themselves by their birthright to the service of the priest. But there's a better word that makes that connection. There is... Of course, Hebrew, the language, a lot of it came from uh, the Chaldean region. As Abraham traveled over from Ur, crossed the Jordan River, and the people there called him the one who crossed over, which is Hebrew. And so they call him that, and so that language kind of formed from that kind of, if you're studying the history of languages, you kind of trace the, um, the Fertile Crescent to learn the history of the, the Hebrew language and how it formed. But the word Levi really has its roots in the Meneans, the Menean language, which is more south of the Promised Land, more almost to Arabia. And there is a Menean word, lavi, which, from which morphed into the word the Hebrews kind of took and made their own, Levi. Lavi means to devote yourself to a service. Now that sounds like the Levites. The Levites devoted themselves to the service of God's priesthood. And that name, that idea kind of stuck and formed around it the word Levi, um, which if, of course it was a son, but it came to mean that idea um, through the Menean usage of the word. But this one that we're speaking of, this Levi, our Levi, our Matthew, does not devote himself to the service of God's priesthood. He devotes himself to a different work. This Matthew is a publican. And as we are introduced to him in the text that we're going to read here in just a minute in Matthew 9, he is a publican who, like all other publicans in Jerusalem and in Judea, are loathed, are detested, are outcasted, are, here's our key word, despised. And we'll define that word here in a little bit. Matthew was a disliked person in his Judean society. Purely and simply and strictly because of the work that he did. The service he attached himself and devoted himself to doing a publican. What is a publican? It is a tax collector. And we make the easy jokes with the IRS and you, there, are, there is some common denominators you can make there. But I don't want you just to, to, um, to limit yourself to thinking, oh, it was just like the first century IRS. Because there's more to it than that that made publicans and tax collectors so reviled. Like, I don't think, surely none of us here, where's Mark Davis? None of us here, or, or, or Jesse um, uh, Whitmire, who uh, hate the person who does your taxes, right? The person you, you help and who helps you organize and sends your taxes. And I would hope even if, if the government sent a person to collect the check instead of you mailing it in, that you wouldn't take out your anger on the person whose job it just is to collect the money. But the publicans of the first century did not just collect the money. That should have been all they did, but there was more to it than that. Nobody likes paying taxes. I would assume we're all right there in that same boat, right? It's, it's a universal thing. It dates back to the first century, too. They didn't like paying their taxes either. They especially didn't like paying taxes in Judea. The Jews especially didn't like paying taxes because they were writing those checks to the Romans. And they didn't like to think about how they were in subjugation to the Roman Empire. They wanted to be their own free, independent people. Well, they were in subject to Rome. And Rome has to collect those taxes. But Rome, being an empire that had some sense about them, knew better than to make a Roman citizen be the publican. They wouldn't send in the Roman guy with the toga and with the thing on his head, the little grass on his head, and walk up there and collect the taxes. This person who is the image of a Roman taking my hard-earned money, that's a good way to stir up a rebellion. You know how I know? Because next week is Independence Day. So they had better sense than that. What did they do? They drew from among the people their own publicans. They said, we will use, in the case of Judea, a Judean person. A Jew will be the tax collector. And if that Jew who has to do this job that no one likes, if he wants to take a little bit on his, for himself, if he wants to you know, inflate the amount that's owed and take a cut for himself, that's fine with us. The Romans will happily look the other way. And so the publicans became these legalized extortioners. They became these people who got away with robbing the people of their hard-earned money. You must owe the Roman Empire so much and so much, plus a finder's fee of so much percent that they'll get to pocket and send the rest to Mother Rome. And because of this, and because it was known, the person paying the money knew that guy was robbing them. The guy knew he knew. Everyone knew that they knew that they were being robbed. These publicans became this outcasted people, this loathed people, this despised people. And it is this people, uh, from that people, that Jesus chose 
his apostle Matthew. It is from that group of people that the Jews loathed, now watch this, that Jesus chose to make a Jew write his autobiography of his ministry. You can read John's account of Jesus' ministry, and it's a very special account written to prove to you that he's the Son of God. You can read Luke's account of his ministry, and it's written for a specific purpose to convince the Greek audience that he is the Savior of humanity. You can read Mark's account of his ministry, and it's Mark's, op it's Mark's opportunity to convince a Roman audience in a very action-packed, Roman-oriented story that Jesus is their Savior too. But when you read the Gospel to the Jews... Remember that gospel was written by a man who was hated by the Jews. Written about a man who was hated by the Jews. Who better to choose than to choose Matthew? So already you can see Jesus' thought process. Of course he would choose someone like this. This is exactly the kind of person that Jesus would be drawn to. Someone who was also despised. Someone who, like him, also has no friends and nowhere to lay his head at night. Someone who is also hated by his peers. And so he chooses Matthew. Let's notice our account that we're going to look at. There's two that I want you to uh, consider. The first one is found in Matthew chapter 9, from which we had our reading just a moment ago. But then we're going to just add a little additional information by looking at Luke's account. But let's notice Matthew's account to start with. So open up to Matthew 9, and we're going to start in verse number 6, and you're going to think, well, you, you're off a of verse. But I want to start at the end of what happened before Jesus meets Matthew for a particular reason. So we're just kind of jumping in in media res, to use a cinematic term. We're jumping in right in the middle of the action of the story, right as Jesus is finishing a miracle. So look at Matthew 9, 6. Jesus says, But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he says to the one who is sick with paralysis, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And then the man arose and departed to his house. So we're at the tail end of a miracle Jesus has done. Here is this person who is bedridden, cannot get up, cannot walk. And Jesus, by his power, his divine power, he says to him, get up and walk. And that's exactly what that man does. He gets up and he walks. Verse 8. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled, as one should upon seeing a miracle. And they glorified God, which had given such a power unto men. Now, pause for just a second. Do you think that this multitude that has gathered, that has now laid eyes on a supernatural event, a man whom they all know is paralyzed and now is able to get up and walk, and they rightly credit Jesus with doing that with a power given to him by God. Do you think those people, when they saw Jesus walk out the door to go to his next destination, thought to themselves, well, that was fun. What are we having to eat? Let's just go home. No. I'll bet you they thought, where's he going next? Let's see what else he's going to do. We have precedent for that. Because that's exactly what they did multiple times. Like when he fed 5,000, what was the next thing that they did? They followed him to see where he was going next. When people see a miracle and they're moved by it, you just want to see another one. Because by definition, a miracle, you've never seen one like it. So you'll want to see another one. So I have it in my mind, this crowd of people, your average, everyday Jew, is following the master as he goes to his next destination. And what is his next destination? What's his follow-up? What's his encore? Keep reading. Look at Matthew 9, verse 9. As Jesus passed forth from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at, the King James says, the receipt of custom, the tax collector's booth. And he said unto him, follow me. And Matthew arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, as Matthew's house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to Jesus' disciples, Ugh, Why does your master eat with publicans and sinners? Doesn't he know we, the Pharisees, the law of the land here, the sheriffs in town, doesn't he know that we, the arbiters of what is right and wrong, justice and unjust, righteous and wicked, doesn't he know that we have deemed such people unworthy of fellowship meals? They can't go to the synagogue with us. They can't sit down and eat common meals with us. They cannot be part of our community. They must be ostracized, the publicans and the sinners with them. And what is your master doing? Eating with such vermin. Eating with such traitors to the race. And Jesus' response, as the reading was, very poetic. He says, you know, the healthy don't need a doctor. The sick need a doctor. 
And you can keep reading because he just starts really burning them here. Look at verse 13. But you go and learn what this means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I have come to call, not call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I didn't come here for the righteous. And what he means by that in the context, I didn't come here for the self-righteous. I didn't come here for the people who made themselves righteous, who think that they're above other people, who think that they're great. I didn't come here for those kind of people because those kind of people won't accept my salvation. Oh, I know he died for them. In that sense, he came for them. What he's saying is, I came to call. I came to invite. I came to have follow me humble people. And Pharisee people, self-righteous people won't follow him. I came to call sinners to repentance. And so through Matthew, he finds a whole feastful of them with whom he can sit and eat and fellowship and invite to follow him. But there's, it's more to it than that. If you just read Matthew's account, maybe it's Matthew the writer's own humility that he doesn't specify. So let's go over to Luke's account. Look at Luke chapter 5. And notice a detail that's missing from Matthew's account. Look at Luke 5.27 to start with. And notice something about the character of Matthew that's just kind of hidden in the text. Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 27. After these things, that is after Jesus did the miracle, he went forth and saw a publican named Levi, that's our Matthew, sitting at the receipt of custom, and he said to him, follow me. And Matthew left all, rose up, and followed him. And then it says, and Matthew made him a great feast in his own house, and there was a great company of publicans and others that sat down with them. Now, that seems like it's the same thing, but that important distinction is it emphasizes that this was Matthew's house, Matthew's feast, and people there by Matthew's invitation. A great company of them came to Matthew's house, which means if Jesus had not been there, a great company of publicans and sinners were going to have dinner with Matthew that evening anyway. It wasn't just because of Jesus. That's kind of the implication you get in Matthew, but leave the, Luke's account makes it more particular. He was always going to invite those people because, of course, he was. They're outcasted by everyone else. You must stick together. You need each other. And Matthew took it upon himself to invite the despised, to bring in the fellow people who are hated, to bring in the people like him who need someone. That kind of heart attracted my Lord. And he thought, here's someone who can be my ambassador. Here's someone who gets it. Here's someone who can represent that aspect of me, because that's what an ambassador does. He can see the despised, and he can have a heart of compassion and a desire to help. That's the Apostle Matthew. That's the one who says, my life is a gift of God, and I want to help. I want to attach myself to this service, and I want to help these people who are likewise despised. I think Jesus saw something of himself in that, not just in being despised, but in having an inviting spirit. That's Matthew. Now we shift gears to Bartholomew, and you're going to think, well, this is just two different sermons that you just smooshed together. We could, be, we could be going home right now. You could be given the invitation. You could preach Bartholomew later. But no, there's a connection between these two apostles. It's tenuous, but there is one. If you give me a chance, I'll make it in just a second. There is a link between these two, and it has to do with this word despise. Matthew was despised. But what do we learn about Bartholomew? Who is Bartholomew? Well, first of all, that ain't his name. His name is Nathaniel. Bartholomew is a nickname, if that. Bar in the Hebrew means son of. And Ptolemy is his daddy's name. This is Nathaniel, son of Ptolemy. This is Nathaniel bar Ptolemy, which as words do, they evolve and they change. Bartholomew, Bartholomew, Bartholomew became that. And through the process of people not studying etymology we just started taking this to mean well this was his name Bartholomew but really it's like it's a nickname this is just who he is he is Bartholomew similar to and here's your father's day interlude similar to Barabbas who when Jesus was offered by Pilate the secondary option was Barabbas a word which means Bar Abba son of a father so the Jews the wicked Jews chose the son of a father over the son of the father so there's your father's day thought all right, anyway, so Bartolome, that's his name. But his real name is Nathaniel. Nathaniel means, listen to this now, God has given. Now, what does Matthew mean? God's gift. Nathaniel, God has given. Now, that's, that's a weak link, okay? Because really, he's Levi. 
But still, I just want to toss that out there. There's a better connection between them that has nothing to do with their names. It has to do with who they are. Matthew was despised. What do we learn about Bartholomew? Well, go to John chapter 1, and let's read the only account we really have about him. Look at John 1, starting in verse 43, and let's notice when Jesus found him. Incidentally, even though we sing it this way, and it's this way in the order of the sermon, Bartholomew was selected before Matthew, but we always sing it, I think, I guess because it rhymes if you sing it that way. But this is early in Jesus' ministry here in John 1 when Jesus finds Bartholomew. You'll see that as we look at verse 43, the day following is, according to verse 42, the day, when, day after Jesus selected Peter. So we're right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He selected Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and now he's also found Philip. Look at verse 43 of John 1. The day following finding Peter, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and found Philip and said unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael, that's our Bartholomew, and said unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. He is Jesus, the son of Joseph, from the town of Nazareth. If you remember from the sermon we did on Philip, we talked about the prejudice of Bartholomew. But let's just notice the excitement in Philip's voice here and how Bartholomew is quick to just deflate that balloon. We found him. John's been preaching about him. He's been telling us he's coming, John the Baptizer. And now we've found him. We've been looking for him and we found him. He is the Messiah, defined here as him whom Moses in the law and also all of the other prophets have been writing about, cluing us in on, preparing us for, and we found him. Great, what's his name? Jesus, makes sense. Name means Savior. Jesus, he is the son of Joseph. Fine, I want you to catch that. He's the son of Joseph, Nathaniel is told. All right, that's, that's in his mind now. It's this guy named Jesus. He is the son of Joseph. By the way, he's also from Nazareth. And if he had a drink, pff, he would have spit it out. Nazareth? Nothing good can come from Nazareth, is Bartholomew's response. Nothing good can come from there. That is the wrong side of the tracks. That's even the wrong part of the country. If you're thinking of from the perspective of the prophecy, the Savior will come from, from Bethlehem in Judah. Well, that's where he was born, but they don't know that. They just know he came from Nazareth. That's his hometown. And they think, no, that's the worst possible town. Nobody ever comes out of there that's any good. That's just a terrible place. The Messiah cannot, will not, I do not believe, came from Nazareth. What are you seeing here? You are seeing a prejudicial person. You are seeing a despiser. Someone who is willing, this is what the word despise means, to put lower than yourself. That's all it means. Here is a person who is willing to take this entire town and all its residents and put it lower than him and think nothing good can come from there. He didn't say the Messiah won't come from there. That's implied. He says nothing good comes from there. Well, that's a bit prejudicial. That's a despiser. So here is Jesus, who we're about to meet later in the, in the narrative, is going to select Matthew, this despised person. Well, I can see that. I can see the connection there, how his heart could be connected to Matthew. But here, Jesus, why would you want Bartholomew? He's a despiser. He's the kind of guy who would hate Matthew. But that's just the nature of my master. He sees what you are. He sees what you can be. And so Philip, invitingly, intriguingly, kind of tickles his fancy, and he says, you come and see. Come and see for yourself. So keep reading the narrative. Look at Luke cha or John chapter 1, verse 44. So uh, come and see. Verse 46. Look at verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him. Now watch what my master does. And he says to him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Now the key word is behold. A word which means, lo, everybody, pay attention. So even though it says, he said to him, I don't want you to think this is a private conversation between these two people. No, this is everybody, look, do you see this guy coming? Everybody get a good look at this guy, Bartholomew, the son of Ptolemy. Look at this guy, Nathaniel's his name. Whatever this guy says, he is an Israelite indeed. A, a phrase which just means, this is a true American. This is the best embodiment of the United Kingdom. You'll never find a greater representation of Italy. This is an Israelite indeed. He embodies the spirit of what it means to be an Israelite. And what is that? According to Jesus, there's no guile in his mouth. What's guile? It means there's no deceit. There's no language that he would speak that would mislead. In other words, look at this guy, everybody. Listen carefully to this guy. Whatever he says, you can take it to the bank. That is Jesus planting a seed setting him up, and he doesn't even realize it. He's telling everybody, listen, 
whatever this guy says, take it to the bank. Now, if you're Nathaniel, you've already dissed this guy's hometown and implicitly him, and you hear this, your response would be his, which is, how do you know me? You don't know me. And Jesus says to him, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, that doesn't mean anything to us, but you've got to remember, Nathaniel, when Philip found him, was just chilling under a tree, alone. There was no one around. And Philip came up and ruined the moment, but he was just relaxing, meditating, contemplating, alone with his thoughts. There was no one around but him and his God. And then here's this guy whom he has heard is the son of Joseph and whom he has dismissed based on his hometown who has said, hey, when you were all alone and you knew there was no one around under that tree, I saw you. Whew. What does he say? He says, you are the Christ, the Son of God. My mistake, that's my fault, I was wrong. You are the Son of God. And Jesus is almost amused because he says, is that, is that all it takes? Just because I told you I saw you under the tree, you believe? And then he says, you ain't seen nothing yet. Isn't that what he says? Look at the text. Look at verse 50. Because I said to you, I saw you under the tree, you believe? You shall see greater things than these. Is that all it takes to blow your mind? You ain't seen nothing yet. You will see heaven open and the angels ascending and descending, which is a reference to Jacob's ladder, which was not a ladder but a stairway. You will see what Jacob saw realized. Jacob, who had his great vision of a stairway that ascended up to heaven, to the throne of God, and angels ascending and descending, doing their work between heaven and earth. And at the top of the stairs was the voice of God saying, your descendants will inherit the earth. A messianic reference. And now here is that Messiah personified. And he says, you will see what Jacob saw like every Tuesday. You'll see one of the greatest miracles ever just on the regular. That blew your mind? Get ready, buckle up, and come follow me. And that Bartholomew, that despiser, shed that persona. And he became Bartholomew. He became Nathaniel, the follower of Jesus. And I doubt he had half a second's thought when those Pharisees said to him, why does your master eat with publicans and sinners? He wasn't on their side. He was on the master's side. I'll tell you why, because he's the son of God. Look at the connection between these two. Jesus chose someone that no one else liked, and he chose someone who didn't like, didn't like other people. And he said, I can use both of these people, and I can make them my own. Now, what about you? Are you a despised person? It hurts. I know it does. My master can use you. My master can, can have you help others who are in your same boat if you follow him and lead them to him too. Are you the kind of person whose first instinct is to look down on someone who's not like you? There's a lot of people like that. My master can use you too if you'll shed that persona and go follow him. If you'll become a Christian and live faithfully. If you're not a child of God, become one by believing him, by repenting to him, by confessing your faith in him, by being baptized into him, Romans chapter 6, so that you can rise to walk and live with him and he'll come back and you can live with him forever and ever. Amen. But if you're not faithful and if you've fallen away, if you've fallen back into old habits, whatever they may be, repent and come back home. If we can help you, let us know how right now. Please come as we stand and sing.